Uh, many different uh, uh, roads to go down. Hyperledger is working, of course, with enterprise, and we have James can speak a little bit to blockchain agnosticism, and uh, Justin, of course, to ETH2 in the general Ethereum roadmap. But I'll give everybody a moment to introduce themselves, beginning with Brian. Okay, I'm Brian Bellendorf. I'm executive director of Hyperledger, which is a project embedded inside the Linux Foundation, which has been around for about 16 years. And we're all about trying to figure out how do you make open source projects that deal with plumbing, with infrastructure, uh, sustainable by uh, building not only communities of developers around it, but communities of corporations that realize enough value, just enough value that they realize they need to feed back in and make this kind of flywheel go, uh, whether it's operating systems or cloud computing or blockchain technology. And that's kind of uh, where Hyperledger comes from. Okay. James? Uh, my name is James Crestwich. I'm a co-founder at Suma. We work on cross-chain interoperability, uh, particularly between Ethereum, Bitcoin, and other chains that weren't designed for this. Uh, typically, we're trying to hack in interoperability where it wasn't meant to go. Uh, I'm Justin Drake, a researcher at the Ethereum Foundation. I mostly focus on uh, Ethereum 2.0, um, all layers of the design, and you know, one of these is the, the light client and, and how friendly we are to others to um, to be a like client. Okay. Uh, so to kick things off a little bit, I think it is important to understand where everybody is looking into the near future to then figure out what needs to be done for us to work a little more closely together, at least to communicate with one another. So to Brian, um, to educate folks here who may be more familiar with ETH2 but less familiar with uh, uh, where Hyperledger is headed, can you chat about the grand vision? <laughs> Um, uh, grand vision. Uh, so uh, four years ago, right, uh, uh, Ethereum was still kind of a roadmap, a, a plan. It was before the ICO. Uh, Bitcoin had you know, arguably taken off and been interesting. Uh, and enterprises were starting to pay attention to it, but had a lot of concerns, right? Partly the regulatory bit, partly proof of work, uh, partly like this sense of where is this technology coming from? And uh, to a lot of us, it sounded very familiar, right? It sounded a little bit like 1998 when the term open source was kind of defined. Uh, and, but, but even like the years before that where uh, projects that were built by communities of developers working together were actually is how we got the internet. It's how we got SMTP and DNS and HTTP and those kinds of things. And so uh, uh, the Linux Foundation had started to hear from different parties, uh, uh, both big corporations, but also companies like Blockstream and even Consensus and others, that there was something interesting here, something very vital, something that built upon uh, history, uh, a history of distributed systems that goes back a couple of decades, right? But had a fresh take on it. And it was worth trying to figure out where can we meet up between um, enterprises that have problems, not so much with programmable money, partly with decentralization, you know, uh, this move to the cloud and the move to kind of two or three providers is great if you're a shareholder in one of those two or three, but kind of lousy for every other enterprise, right? Uh, so so where, where could we meet that up? And really it was started with that idea and a bunch of the companies that came together kind of pooled some projects they'd been working on, some code from IBM that they had called initially internally open blockchain and then we, uh, it was called Fabric, code from Intel uh, that was kind of an R&D platform called Sawtooth, uh, and uh, code from some other places like Digital asset and it was kind of like let's put this in a pot let's actually because everyone's concerned about tokens and and ICOs and things like that let's kind of distance ourselves a bit from it not from tokenization as an approach to kind of doing digital assets but from the proof of work kind of bit and from kind of the speculative financial instrument kind of bit of it and let's just see are there other use cases to apply this to from uh, the way that that banks send payments to each other to supply chain traceability to all sorts of things and so uh, that initial body of code didn't include anything in the Ethereum space uh, but when I joined in May of 2016, the project was kind of launched 2015, May of 2016, uh, one of my first trips abroad was to DevCon 2 in Shanghai. Uh, and I'd been following the Ethereum space. I actually talked to um, uh, uh, Vitalik and Bo Shen when they did the roadshow for the original ICO. And I was like, there's something important here. There's something urgent uh, here. And there's certainly this kind of enthusiasm from the community that I hadn't seen since the early days of the web. So I always felt like we needed to have some sort of relation, some sort of bridge to that community. Um, and, and while we built up this ecosystem around Fabric and around Sawtooth and saw that start to get used in production systems, I realized what we were also doing was educating the market, educating the enterprise world on what really blockchain technology could be, right? Even if we were having them take these kind of baby steps forward, 
uh, into just building you know, partially distributed systems. Some sort of minimum viable centralization, right, was, was kind of built into all these networks. Um, now fabric is in a lot of different places, right, but it was still pretty clear that we, we, couldn't, we couldn't just be about fabric. We couldn't just be about one technology, one core. It had to be about a family of technologies. And so um, now in 2019, the kind of vision around Hyperledger is can we be that, that ground uh, that explores that entire spectrum from permissioned to permissionless blockchain technology, um, whether it's down in the weeds at the protocol layer, at the, at the uh, uh, you know, how do you forge these DLTs, uh, to what are the different smart contract engines there, to the crypto cryptography layers, crypto is cryptography, um, uh, to all the way up to end user interfaces, to the explorers, to the kind of dApps and, and those sorts of things, and really focus it on how do we get all the enterprises in the world to adopt this and take this for granted the way that all of you take plumbing uh, uh, for granted, you know, that you turn the, 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 the spigot and you get hot water, right? Um, and that's a multi-pronged effort that's going to involve a lot of things. Now, though, we have a lot of new firepower from this community on our side um, with the Hyperledger Bezu project, which started uh, just over a month ago, another project called Avalon that builds off of the Trusted Compute Framework from Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. Uh, and, and it's really exciting. And I think that for the next year, our focus at Hyperledger is going to be in kind of hybridizing and synthesizing all these different pieces we've brought together to take advantage of all the really smart people and all the really smart uh, architectures that have been uh, poured into this body of code. Gotcha, thank you very much. So uh, to Justin, a bit of a, a, a brief overview. Uh, Serenity has been something that everybody's been waiting for since the, the, the names were sort of released with our testnet Olympic, then Frontier, Homestead, Metropolis, and Serenity. It's changed forms many times, but uh, now we are just months away from phase zero. Uh, the design framework is very clear. Could you speak a little bit to what the grand vision looks like, uh, 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 both for permissionless, for scalability, uh, and privacy preserving elements, uh, phase two and beyond? A little bit about Serenity as an overview for those here who may not be as familiar. Okay, um, I guess in the context of interoperability, the, the, the big thing that we, the big thing in Serenity is sharding, right? And here is the idea that you have multiple blockchains and they're kind of homogeneous. And so the idea is to try and, even though we have this uh, asynchronous communication between the various shards for scalability, um, this, we're trying to, to minimize the cost uh, by having these, uh, these fast crosslinks between them that share all the crypto, share the networking, uh, and share consensus. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the other part in, in terms of interop interoperability for, for EVE2 is, uh, you know, to, to be a very good player in the ecosystem. Um, arguably, EVE1 is uh, not friendly to interoperability, like our proof of work is, is kind of hard to, to, to be verified on, on other blockchains, and we've, we've made all sorts of research to, one, um, make the cost from a, a bandwidth perspective as small as possible, but also the computational cost as small as possible, and one of the, and that's one of the things that's unlocked through proof of stake, which is the other big component of, of Serenity. And um, just in, just to summarize how our strategy here is basically to to use committees. So we have this large number of validators, let's say a million validators. Uh, we have an honesty assumption. We assume, for example, that two thirds are honest or one half are honest. We sample using randomness a much smaller committee, and then we ask this committee okay, can you attest to where the Ethereum system is at right now? And so it suffices for another blockchain to just verify these attestations. And one of the, the big uh, tools that we're using here is BLS aggregation. Um, and so if every attester is signing to the same message, you have this really nice uh, aggregation which makes uh, verifying um, these uh, attestations extremely cheap. So we're at a point now where um, running an EVE2 light client is probably uh, cheaper, is cheaper than uh, running a, a, a Bitcoin light client. Gotcha. Uh, so now I'm going to kick to James. Uh, we see this kind of rounding out, right? So Hyperledger began as a, Brian said, minimally viable centralized nature. We're spread out over the spectrum to sort of see what works. Uh, with ETH2, we have the grand vision. Uh, but of course still having a large ecosystem, creating some subset of standards that work together regardless of, of where they're implemented. Can you speak a bit to the work that's been done uh, uh, that you've worked on through both SUMA, ideas and development, research is taking place through TUSD, 
uh, uh, and so on and so forth. Sorry, TBTC. So, you know, where Hyperledger kind of explores the trade-off space and hasn't decided, you know, where it fits, it's trying to serve as many purposes as possible and help other people build. ETH2 is trying to build this homogenous, unified ecosystem. Uh, Summa, rather than trying to make every chain the same, uh, rather than trying to explore as much of the trade-off space as possible, we're trying to take all of the chains that exist, that have users today, and turn them into a unified, heterogeneous ecosystem. So take Bitcoin and Ethereum and Cosmos and ensure that those can all interoperate together. And provide tools to private chains, like Hyperledger projects, uh, to interoperate with public chains efficiently. Um, so we're kind of at a slightly different point in the trade-off space than ETH2. We're trying to be everywhere, take everything that's different, and bring it in so that it can all work together. I'm, I'm going to follow. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Jessica. I was ahead. just going to follow up here. There's there's kind of a, a, a spectrum of of friction and barriers. So yeah. there's like a single chain where basically the friction is kind of a synchronous, you know. Uh, cross-contract communication, that's the lowest barrier to entry, but still still there is some friction, and this is why we have standards like ERC-20. And then kind of the next layer of friction is homogeneous sharding. Um, and then um, and the next layer of friction is, if you think, for example, of Polkadot, where they have a, a, a unified uh, unification at the consensus layer, but they have non-homogeneous parachains. Yes. And then the next step is things like, like Cosmos and Suma. I think that's fair to say. So this is actually a great transition here. The um, uh, uh, public projects have become to have have began to over time emulate each other a little bit more, and I think that this is somewhat true as well for some of the Hyperledger projects. Um, I don't believe it was intended. They've just seem to have found the same design framework as having generally represented a correct answer in some sense. Um, have you seen, uh, uh, you mentioned one large coming project in the space, Cosmos as well, uh, Polkadot Cosmos, uh, somebody spoke backstage to work that IOHK has done also in a similar area, and of course East 2 is, East 2 is now working within a framework of uh, homogeneous rather than heterogeneous, but still the same approach. Um, so, I shall run back to Brian with this uh, so, to sort of round it out. What are enterprises looking for in, in, obviously, looking back to the base question of why not use a server? There are certain things that blockchains offer, right? And a lot of that is the openness, the permissionlessness. It's just doing it with the same level of, uh, the same feature set, same capability, throughput. What are enterprises looking for specifically that the permissionless systems haven't offered? And do they see answers in these design frameworks? So Joe actually was here uh, uh, just before our session uh, talking about his view that you know, the world will have lots of different ledgers, some of them very public facing and some of them uh, fairly private amongst uh, uh, collections of organizations, right? And, and that's be for a number of reasons, some of them technical, some of them kind of business oriented. Uh, the, one, the, the, answer, the, the technical reasons may fade over time. I mean, right now, I'd say there's an advantage to uh, permissioned ledgers, which actually can be public facing. For example, the Sovereign Foundation is used Using Hyperledger Indie to build a public facing but permissioned blockchain ledger around digital identity, right? Uh, and there's all sorts of things in Indie that are highly tuned to the pairwise identifiers approach that they take, that for everything from the consensus mechanism to the data structure on disk to, to everything. Um, uh, but uh, but uh, so there's some performance characteristics that perhaps the F2 architecture, perhaps other architectures that arrive, uh, close the gap on some of those uh, from performance and, and, and other kind of points of view. But I think there's still gonna be some business constraints. So for example, being able to say that all the nodes on this network uh, agree to be bound by GDPR, right? Uh, or agree to be bound by saying, hey, we're, we're going to put text on this network that uh, for the purpose of efficiency, we're going to encrypt minimally. And if you try to decrypt it or you try to discover uh, some data that you're not supposed to have access to, then there is a legal constraint that kind of constrains you that you assign a contract and agree, I'm not going to divulge this data, right? Uh, or, or other types of business arrangements that are actually better to express in human contract form between the parties around some common uh, kind, of a, 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 a kind of governance entity 
uh, than, than through purely through smart contract mechanisms. Again, those might fade away as some of the uh, ability to manage confidential data and things get better and better on the public ledgers. Uh, but but there's, a, 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 there's a spectrum here. There's trade-offs. And I think we are going to see this heterogeneous world of public, uh, 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 of unpermissioned and permissioned, of public facing and private facing uh, uh, blockchains. You're kind of two independent dimensions uh, for, for the indefinite future. I don't know that that ever converges on one. So I, I have a question for both James and Justin. Uh, to James first, uh, interoperability with private chains uh, or permission chains, um, is, it, is it functionally viable? Is it a two-way road? Or are there constraints there? Uh, you know, typically the way interoperability works is that we have one chain checking the consensus process of another. So when you want to have Ethereum inspect Bitcoin transactions, you have to actually import Bitcoin headers into a smart contract. So obviously we can do that within a private chain, validate a public chain's consensus. That's like trivially easy to do. Um, the other way around, we can't really do with any sort of security. For a permissioned chain, uh, the consensus mechanism is usually a federation of signers that can do whatever they want. And so validating that on a public chain has essentially the same security model as an oracle, is we're importing you know, information about this chain, but we're just trusting the signers to do it. So this may be useful in some cases, but I would suspect that we see it as a one-way road most of the time. Okay, uh, I have uh, uh, the follow-up for Justin was sort of similar. I don't know if it's a solution in any sense, but I've heard the idea kicked around uh, a little bit of using uh, uh, execution environments to, in, in, this is far off in the future, I understand, and that research is nowhere near done. But it, it, there was an idea, maybe you could speak to a little bit about it, maybe slotting those in for some of these larger you know, permission pieces. I think it was Vitalik mentioned it in a panel not that long ago. Um, the use of it, I guess the question is about use of, potential use of execution environments to help bridge that gap. Any, could you speak, I guess, first to execution environments themselves, so those who are less familiar with them, and uh, two, about their potential capability? Right, so um, execution environments are kind of a layer of abstraction which allows um, anyone to kind of graft their business logic on top of the consensus but in a much more low-level way than a, a small contract. So you can even like, you can think of it as uh, programming your own VM, uh, and you don't have the overhead of the Ethereum VM as a starting point. Um, and I guess this could be helpful in the context of private chains that um, have a roadmap to become more and more public over time. Um, and as you mentioned, maybe these pri private chains, they don't want to uh, have to deal with tokens, and have to deal with um, you know, permission security in the permissionless model, and instead they just want to reuse an existing uh, working secure blockchain. And so um, one model here would be to just drop, drop their existing consensus that they've tested in the private world and then drop it in uh, to uh, an execution engine, or you could also drop it in as a, a you know, Polkadot parachain. That would kind of be a similar thing. But regardless, having some universal standard, or at least one that is used widely, seems to offer a great deal of benefits over time. Uh, you have ideas on uh, things that might fit into a decent standard stack. Uh, uh, we spoke about briefly, I hope I'm not preempting, you know, just commentary in future, but could you, I guess, outline a little bit, some of which we spoke uh, about not too long ago, um, about what fits into that stack, those pieces being worked on now, elements of a, uh, Emberlin's elements of standards. I mean, if you're going to slot in to an execution engine or going to slot in as a Polkadot parachain, then you want to try and express your consensus in WASM because that's what these two systems uh, will be doing. Um, and it, it will also be helpful if um, you express, you know, the the application layer itself in WASM because you know um, it will all be one one system. Um, I mean, if you want to do uh, something more ambitious and have your, your own blockchain, your own consensus, then it, it is helpful to um, try and converge on the blockchain standards that, that are emerging at a lower level. So at the networking level, at the crypt cryptographic level. Um, so for example, at the cryptographic level, you could use SHA-256 for hashing, BLS-1281 uh, for signatures. That's a great starting point. Uh, for networking, you could consider libp2p as a great starting point um, if, you, if, if that's part of your, your more ambitious roadmap. Um, um, so real, sorry, real go quick, ahead, James. Uh, 
On the subject of using execution environments for permission systems, I think Brian made a really interesting distinction between public facing and private facing uh, in, as an additional access to public and private, or uh, permission and unpermission. Thanks. Um, right. So using an execution environment to create a permissioned but public facing system might be useful. It gives public verifiability without necessarily public participation. Right. Um, and if you if you want to be public but also have privacy, this is yet another dimension, then you need to start getting fancy with zero knowledge proofs maybe. Yeah. So I'm gonna come back to Brian for something a little more macro, um, but related. So the innovation, and this might be something you disagree with to some extent, but a lot of the innovation is taking place in the public space. Especially, I mean, all of this was born out of the open source you know, this of it. Uh, um, and it changes quickly, right? So we could speak to the research being done by e EF researchers uh, or around the Ethereum space to uh, uh, IBC or, or so on and so forth. Um, I guess the question that I would ask is what, um, what specifically are some of the uh, member organizations uh, interested in and, and what could potentially be done to help connect them with those that may be building toward that future? Uh, for example, and a couple of quick examples, uh, would it be if they're interested in privacy preserving elements like uh, ZK Rollup so that uh, they could protect their customer and consumer information while offering uh, something on a public network with that level of security? Would they be interested in funding research or lending developers? What are they interested in and how can they drive toward making it a reality? So in technology movements, there's kind of a, a boom-bust cycle of uh, ideas that get tried and then eventually as a space matures, things kind of whittle down, yeah. right, into here's, the, here's the, the, the architectures, the concepts that actually seem to provide the most value for the least amount of lines of code and the least amount of complexity, right? Um, and I would argue in 2016, we didn't know what those are. I'd say I argue in 2019, we still haven't figured out what that final set is, right? And so I, I, innovation can't just be about, hey, we've come up with a new idea. It should be about, like, how do we systematically try to map the solution space give those who are passionate about these different ideas the free reign to kind of build their own kind of roadmaps, decide which parts of that problem they want to tackle first, which ones they're happy to say, here's a 1.0, right? Here's something that now I'm comfortable you use with you using my software completely without my involvement to track digital assets. Like that's like a, a big kind of like uh, threshold, right? But let's try a number of these experiments. Let's allow Darwin to kind of play, allow uh, uh, you know those that succeed to, 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 to keep iterating and going for forward. But the real question is, how do we make sure, make sure that good ideas that are embedded inside of the projects that don't achieve that kind of critical mass don't just get lost or don't get uh, I, I, you know, kind of uh, dis, uh, uh, dismissed because they happen to have the wrong uh, brand on them, the wrong license, the wrong set of characters around them. How do we use that as mulch for the other projects that do continue to go forward and move on? Which was at least our rationale inside of Hyperledger for having this kind of greenhouse metaphor for these different uh, in, uh, projects, right? And some of them have turned out very well, like um, Hyperledger Indie, which is, again, hyper-focused hyper on identity, has been able to like go and not have to bother with upgrading the entire world every time they want to try to uh, invent some new topic or throw away an experiment that they did that didn't actually turn out well, right? Uh, uh, and other projects like Hyperledger Quilt, which has been our implementation of the ILP standard, which just kind of failed to get anybody excited about it, right? I, I, I mean, I, I'm following closely stuff going on at IBC and with Cosmos and that sort of thing. I think that's great. Uh, but, uh, uh, but that was an experiment we tried, and, and it's still alive. You can all go check it out still and use it, but uh, um, it's, you have to be able to like be willing to take these experiments and risks. And I see our role as being very much about provide that space, allow people to evolve, but put these projects kind of on a conveyor belt to a 1.0 release and eventually something that uh, conservative organizations, you know, who don't like to upgrade every month, uh, who don't want to necessarily worry about a hard fork forcing them to have to upgrade systems or, uh, tomorrow, right, or, or even at a, a pre-planned time six months in advance, like they want to be a little bit more in control of the rate of change on their networks, right? Um, how do we get them comfortable with the idea of using this technology when it's appropriate, when it's not appropriate, right? Um, uh, and kind of provide training reels for these organizations so they can eventually get caught up to the more forward-leading organizations like those of you in the room. Gotcha. I'm going to kick to Justin. The uh, uh, Coming off of this, 
There are, I've heard some talk of large, uh, large organizations in the public space that are replicating efforts, um, whether it be research, the P2P, WASM research. Um, so coming off of what Brian's spoken about and then flipping the question on its head, uh, there's, to some extent, a million developers aside, a limit on mind share of those that are able to develop at the, uh, the core of the core, right? Um, what would you find beneficial from, uh, let's say, both enterprises and other public blockchain ecosystems in regard to interoperability or collaboration, collaborative efforts, um, to help both be able to produce what they're looking for and to avoid uh, replication uh, of efforts? Right, so, I mean, after this panel, I have a whole talk on collaboration. Gotcha. Um, and, um, you know, there's, there's, there's many things we can do. We can, um, you know, at, uh, we can try and focus on low-level components, which are very modular, things that are designed to be reused. Um, we can try and, you know, at, uh, at the legal level, try and avoid things like uh, bad licenses, even bad open source licenses. Um, we can try and avoid patents. We can try and avoid things like trademarks and NDAs. Um, we can also, um, you know, be open from the get-go. Um, you know, at the risk of being a bit more chaotic and messy, try and open up your doors. <laughs> Um, so that we can all learn from, mis from the mistakes because yeah. some teams what they do is that they, they spend two years working on something and then they, they ship something perfect uh, but it's, it's a lose-lose because um, they could have gone feed gotten feedback earlier on and we could have learned from their, their failed uh, experiments. It's interesting thought. Uh, so James, on that note, uh, uh, there are specific projects that enterprises have given to the uh, public blockchain space. Um, that are open source, uh, uh, taking Nightfall as an example, um, do you see them as, they are beneficial, and we thank them for their work, I'm sure. Um, are there elements of that that I guess we could be, uh, uh, that we could work with more closely together to make sure that uh, they're beneficial to the space, so they have upside, downside? Uh, I definitely think so. So Nightfall is an interesting example because it's a cryptographic system and it's very difficult for non-cryptographers to interact with or to understand how to reuse components of. Um, but I think as far as like the IBM blockchain and the Deutsch blockchain and all of these huge enterprise blockchain processes, we haven't seen a lot of useful code fall out of it. Um, we have people like the uh, Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, Ethereum Enterprise Alliance, EEA, whatever mm -hmm. it's called, uh, working with enterprises, trying to serve their needs and ensure that they give back to the community. Uh, but I can't think of you know any enterprise-driven applications on chains that I've actually used. So uh, IBM has like 40 full-time engineers uh, yep. releasing every line of code that they write on Fabric yep. out as soon as they write it. Okay, right. so that's great. Yeah, and, and, um, and they're about 40% uh, of the total IP going into Fabric, so there's another you know, two, uh, uh, yeah. you know, bundle of people outside and other companies, Huawei, Deloitte, others that go into Fabric too. So. Perfect. So uh, I want to catch up with you about Fabric. You could do a better job telling the world about that, I think. Yeah. yeah. So digging back into uh, uh, technical interoperability, the Work that's being done on the public side, I guess we'll speak to first. Justin's outlined a few of them. Uh, a few others have been brought up on stage, like IBC work, um, privacy preserving elements. Uh, uh, uh. So I'd first like to uh, kick to Justin to hear a little bit about what those leading areas may be. And I'm going to then come back to Brian and figure out um, are different standards, similar standards being worked on in the enterprise space and how can they uh, uh, begin to share that work where even if it's being open sourced, apparently it's not being communicated uh, uh, to, the, to the best possible, you know, and of course, comms in blockchain, I, I know, it's, it's a limited number of people. Uh, 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 so leading areas of uh, potential technical and operable uh, focus, what are we looking at as of now? I mean, one trend that I'm uh, particularly excited and is, is leading the way forward in terms of um, light trends and interoperability is um, a Celo and Coda. So they're, they're going down the uh, snark based light clients, um, and they're, they're bringing in you know, very sophisticated machinery, uh, you know, recursive snarks. One is like the fully recursive um, in the case of Coda, and then in the case of Celo, is like one lev level of recursion. 
Um, and I think this is great you know, in terms of you know, minimizing the cost of interoperability. Because at the end of the day, um, you know, when you have uh, a very flexible virtual machine like Wasm, then you know, in theory, you can be a light client for any other um, you know, blockchain. But in practice, the limiting factor is just cost. And by cost, I mean the, you know, the gas cost in transaction fees. And so there, there really is a big engineering effort to be done to squeeze that cost down to almost nothing. Um, and, and, and these projects are, are leading that. Another kind of interesting consequence, potentially, of the, the SNARKs approach is that um, it could be kind of a common language for all the various light clients to speak, because every blockchain has a different consensus. And so every time you build a bridge between two blockchains, that's like a custom ad hoc build bridge, uh, which requires a lot of sophistication. But maybe if we can you know, um, encode these, uh, these algorithms in, you know, uh, in circuits and then abstract away all the complexity in the SNARK, that might be one way to, to move forward. Okay. And a quick, sorry, James, go ahead. Well, uh... I want to push back a little bit on SNARKs as like an interoperability mechanism. The main thing that they're useful for is making updates of expensive things cheap. Uh, unfortunately, when we're running a light client on chain, the amount of updates is still linear in the frequency of the reads. Uh, mm. So if there's a lot of people reading the system, your SNARK-based system will converge back to just updating once per header rather than skipping a bunch of blocks. Right, so um, one of the additional uh, benefits of SNARKs is that you can um, combine some of the application layer logic. Mm -hmm. And one of the, you know, you could, one of the interesting uh, pieces of application logic, which actually is kind of between consensus and application, is going to be the, the, the Merkle paths, the witnesses. So generally speaking, you have uh, data on one, on one chain, you have the root, the light client is responsible for moving the root over, and then the user is responsible for moving the data and the witness. And in practice, the, 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 the data is a, a fraction of the, of the total cost in terms of data. You have the, the, the Merkle paths are just much bigger. And so there's this idea of using SNOCs for witness compression. You can take um, all the witnesses for all the data and compress that down to 200 bytes. In, and in, even include that in the, the root update. Um, but yes, I agree that if you're going to do very frequent reads with low granularity, um, the, the overhead of the light client starts disappearing, and then you have these other overheads, but they can also be subsumed in the SNOC. Great, but we have to plan for the worst case scenario because you know, combining a bunch of SNARKs into one, aggregating SNARKs is an interactive off-chain process, right? Um, well, you kind of, you know, in the way that chains work right now, you have like uh, transactions in the mempool, and then you have a block pr producer that will batch everything, and then that entity that's already there doing the batching can also do go one step further and do uh, snarkification and compression. Yeah, can also or must also. Um, can in in theory, but in practice, uh, must if, if if the costs are too high. I find this helpful in uh, uh, if, if, whether it's done in a hallway or on stage uh, for us to really uh, press each other and break things down. So to Brian, uh, it's a very similar question. Leading areas of research that uh, uh, you've been seeing in all different areas of hyperledger's focus, um, is some of this beneficial that you might bring back and how might uh, uh, what's being worked on in camp be communicated back to the public side? To some degree. I mean, so uh, Project Avalon, which was just launched, is a, a project with Consensus, Kaleido, uh, Microsoft, Intel, iExec, a couple of other companies are here uh, to try to uh, look at how do you manage and, and distribute. Uh, uh, let's see if I got the bullet point right. It's <laughs> uh, uh, like, the, coming up with like short descriptions of these projects is really hard, but it's how do you manage off-chain uh, 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 secure enclave types of uh, resources as a way to optimize and simplify certain transactions that otherwise would need to be uh, a lot more expensive to perform around uh, ver uh, providing confidentiality to transactions and other types of things. So uh, uh, it's uh, something that implements the trusted compute framework uh, definition that the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance has been working on. Uh, uh, they, there's 
a lot of interesting ideas there. And it's, it's still earlier days, and it's still more of a raw R&D kind of thing. Um, but you know, I also want to say a lot of what enterprises need right now uh, is a system that provides uh, immediate settlement uh, uh, around a common system of record. Uh, with everybody being able to verify this is the right order of transactions, uh, 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 implementing prevention of double spend, <laughs> uh, being able to implement um, a, a confirmation logic in the form of smart contracts or chain code, whatever they, you want to call it. Uh, and through that, you can solve a huge number of, of kind of use cases that otherwise require parking a central server and having somebody run that. Uh, I, and, 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 and this is a way you can get rid of Swift, you could get rid of uh, a lot of these counterparties that today require a lot of trust. Sometimes it's earned, sometimes it's not, right? Sometimes it's just mandated. Uh, uh, and, and this is what's driving a lot of the enterprise interest in blockchain technology today. So I kind of feel like sometimes a lot of the really thorny work and hard work that is being uh, funded by the EF and that is being worked on by this community is going to matter quite a bit uh, down the road with these enterprise blockchain networks when they have hundreds or thousands of participants operating exactly as peers, right? When they have a lot of sophistication, a lot of hostile actors on the networks that they have to try to algorithmically prevent. Um, today, you can make up for a lot of that with better uh, with, with forms of human governance uh, that operate at smaller scale, uh, but still provide enough of that guarantee. And frankly, enough of this is still the right to fork, since everybody has a copy of the ledger. If they disagree, they can go their separate ways, uh, and that provides enough of a check on tyranny. Um, I will say, sometimes being too early is just as bad as being wrong. Uh, I've seen a lot of uh, uh, both internet startups as well as standards efforts that uh, uh, try to define a world and solve problems long before the world was ready for them. In the early 2000s, there was a bunch of standards work around OAuth and OpenID that tried to essentially say, if we're going to build a decentralized social network, here's all the building blocks to do it. And they're all relatively finished. It just turned out that Facebook took off and everybody went to that. And there was no, both no funding as well as no momentum behind independent implementations of all these underlying technologies. And so I think we just have to be careful about going too far down a rabbit hole that doesn't have enough uh, I, I end user validation and enough momentum to make sure that we're not solving problems that don't actually end up uh, being problems by the time the world is ready for that software. Does that okay. make sense? It does. We have just a couple of minutes left. So we've spoken over the last almost 40 minutes about different, uh, 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 different efforts on the research end for, for bringing this whole ecosystem together, whether they are on the private end or on the public end. In the last couple of minutes, I'm going to ask a question that I'm personally curious about. Um, we've seen things, again, in their design framework come much closer together over the last few years. I used to know, 2015 or so, what might this look like in four years, right? I, you figure we're probably there a little bit sooner than we are, so on and so forth. Uh, what does Hyperledger's uh, uh, going down the line to close, what is, uh, and hopefully if you can, about 50 seconds, uh, what does it look like in four or five years when these systems are developed? Does it, is it all too different from the public space, and what does the public space look like? Uh, my hope is that there's um, a, a handful of technologies that people can pick up and deploy without thinking twice, that there's an API they can use and not worry too much about what's going on under the covers. But if they need to, it's open source. They can drill in and figure out what's going on and fix things if they need. Uh, I do see us pretty much sticking to being a place where software gets built and leaving standards work up to folks like EEA or the EIP process or uh, other groups kind of thinking about how do you uh, uh, get agreement between parties about kind of the protocol layer, but uh, when you want to come together and simply get better leverage on, uh, you know, the precious time that it takes to put software together, that's, that's why working together in any open source community uh, makes sense. And James. that's what we want to keep doing for the next four years. Thank you. Uh, so what does Sumo look like in four years? Um, I think that depends a lot on what the whole ecosystem looks like in four years. At Sumo, we try to work on the chains with the most impact. Uh, today, that means Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, Cosmos and Polkadot are up and coming, and there's a handful of other chains that are interesting. Um, we've started working with private chains as well. We've worked a little bit with like Quorum, um, like just playing around with it. I'm hopeful that within four years, we'll have a better idea of what this space looks like and we'll be running multiple cross-chain relays in multiple ecosystems. Justin. Um, well, I'm hopeful that in four years, you know, we'll have um, figured out a scalable uh, you know, uh, interoperability within the context of Ethereum and, and homogeneous shards, but also hopeful that uh, we'll be you know, working very closely with um, components that fit, for example, in the, in the Web3 framework. So, uh, you know, decentralized storage at scale, for example, 
as a nice complement to, to decentralized uh, computation and, and data availability. Um, also looking forward to um, you know, interacting with you know, the most vibrant pockets of activity. It could be Polkadot, it could be, you know, it could be Bitcoin, for example, and then using, for example, Cosmos as bridges. I'm, I'm just, it's very hard to predict the future, but I'm quite excited regardless. I look forward to seeing where the vision goes. Maybe open social is not dead yet. Thank you all for participating and look forward to the rest of the day. Thanks so much. Thanks.